Good afternoon, and my name is Veronica Torres. I am here on Zimbabwe Live. This is our first television show of the afternoon, and we have some fantastic guests from Zimbabwe. I will not say their last names because that will confuse me. So today we have Lauren, Wilder, Jocelyn, Eulalia, and Lynette. And Lynette told me that his, his name in Shauna means troublesome, but we will have none of that. <laughs> so we will start with Lynette today and we'll put Lynette Let's start for girls program. I know it's good because I've actually been there, but tell me a little bit about the, the education work that you do. What does it involve? What does it look like? Thank you, Veronica. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to share notes with the rest of the team. Yes, uh, I'll focus on the education uh, pillar, which is basically a life skills. Uh, oriented pillar which is aimed at promoting uh, 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 producing a holistic learner especially girls what do i mean when i say holistic i mean a complete individual who is able to participate economically after school and during school who is able to make informed decisions that is the main aim but the, the, I'll go on to, ask, to, to, to answer the question which you may not have asked to say how, how do you uh, how do you achieve the aims? So how we, we do it is that we target the teachers, the learners, and even the parents. So for the teachers, we build their capacity to deliver in a gender responsive and inclusive manner moving away from the traditional you know, approach of lecturing. The gender responsive and inclusive manner is participatory. It caters for the needs of the girls. So we are we have started see, seeing early results in that the teachers are now, we have been able to train them and the teachers are now able to deliver in that manner, which is gender, gender responsive. They are able to, you know, to cater for the needs of the girls. We have seen that, we are able to see, to observe that during monitoring the visits. And then for the learners, we are building their capacity, uh, their, their agency, and their leadership skills. And how do we do that? We are, we are, we are exposing them to platforms that enable them to, to gain confidence, gain visioning skills, to gain organization and planning skills, and even decision making skills. And we have, we have started seeing that in, in, the, in the girls and even in the learners. Yeah, they started you know, engaging policy makers, advocates, taking up advocacy actions, and they're engaging um, the policy makers, they are developing policy papers that are adulated to lead. So you see that in most cases, when we are advocating, we tend to advocate as, as adults. But in this case, the girls are the ones that take the leadership role, they advocate for themselves. They engage policy, uh, policy makers, they, they engage you know, school authorities on issues that affect their welfare. So we have started seeing early results in this project. We are also empowering uh, uh, our learners, especially girls with practical skills, with pre-vocational skills, so that they, they are able to take up those uh, you know, uh, subjects that are mainly male-dominated. For example, mathematics, science, we, we, we previously we used to see a few girls taking up such subjects, we call them STEM, STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, <laughs> mathematics. But now we, are, we have started seeing the girls taking up those practical learning areas, engineering, we have started seeing them participating in agriculture. 
So those are the areas that we call the three vocational learning areas. So we are also giving them platforms to practice the three vocational skills. So in this case, we, we have agriculture, which is the, the predominant subject in Zimbabwe. So most of the girls are engaging in, in they've taken up agriculture and they've started income generating activities that are agro-based and they've started experiencing, you know, the practical skills at school level and they've started running the income generating activities and, you know, gaining business management skills. So I, I think in a big nutshell, that is what comprises the education pillar exists. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manesti. And I'm going to ask, well, it's really fascinating work, this pre-vocational work. I want to know more about the vocational training and all the skills building that I know Lawrence has been working on as well. Thank you, Veronica. How are you, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are not happy. What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Any challenges? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica, for that. Uh, I will repeat I'm Lawrence, uh, specifically concentrating on uh, women economic empowerment, but I'm not going to make it hard. Two, the economic empowerment with this type of girls. In this case, we are again focusing mainly on youth. So, with the economic empowerment, what I can say is whatever you do, it should be evidence based. How can this be evidence based? We start with uh, youth analysis assessment. So, that's, that was our case to really understand what we want. Uh, to walk the talk, we have to work with them. We have, we have to work with them. And we thought it was good uh, to actually really understand what fits them and what we did through the youth analysis assessment. Uh, they actually showed that there was the need of these vocational training uh, courses. So they actually volunteered or they suggested a number of courses which they really wanted to do to embark on. But we had uh, to work with the uh, technical professional centers. Some of them, some will call them book tech uh, centers. Yes, that's a stage uh, in terms of technical skilling. That's a stage in terms of uh, technical skills building for the youth. That was their major interest. So I am just building, I'll come to other activities which we do in terms of uh, ensuring that we economically empower uh, the youth and the communities. But with the Veronica's question, which focuses on uh, professional components, uh, what we did was after getting the different types of skills which the youth wanted to be capacitated in, we decided, okay, we have to go through another assessment to see oh, what previously and up to where we started, that was 2022 to January 2023, what was actually uh, to some extent uh, disadvantaging you to venture into those different technical skills. We discovered that the majority of the female youth, they had a number of uh, disadvantages, especially uh, traditional uh, laid down uh, norms. These traditional laid down norms could not allow them to go into most of these professional training centers because uh, the family commitment uh, actually pulled them down. And then we see, then what could be the opportunities around this? Another thing which I need to take note of here, which I took note of was, whatever we have challenges, let those challenges be opportunities. We have the people who, who traditionally was disadvantaged because she couldn't delete some of the different activities, the domestic cause and the woman, all that. But then many would not only sit down and cry and say, I can't do anything. And in Zimbabwe, I believe it might not be a concept in Zimbabwe alone, but in many other places, we came up with this mentorship approach, whereby the youth would be instead of all of them venturing into 
vocational training centers, they will be trained or skilled within their communities. Thus building from what emulates the troubleshooter as the shoulder name suggests. <laughs> so the youth will be trained within their communities, taking care of some of the family goals, taking care of we, we know the babysitting, the babysitting issues, they have to take make sure that their babies will make ensure that the training environment itself accommodates them in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the mentor uh, mentorship uh, scenarios. We have to make sure that the time itself, the curriculum itself is developed to suit uh, what the community needs to home needs, then so that they can answer or be able to respond to their home needs. At the same time, managing to get skilled. And those skills would actually answer being able to respond to their community needs, would be actually a carryover from pre vocational training to uh, a, a higher level, whereby vocational training centers staff would actually give a technical support to what we call master craft persons who are community based, who would technically give those skills or impart skills to the youth, especially the people youth who is based within the community. Thus, carrying over from the pre vocational stage, moving over to the undergraduate approach, whereby now we are working with uh, at least a more mature uh, youth who need maybe a different types of approach, which I tell you, we got some of those approach from uh, it's the Court Institute, the adult learning approaches, which were facilitated by court to our vocational training centers, <coughs> which they imparted to the master craft person so that they could accommodate the youth who are in the community to get those schools. And they were imparted in different schools, which include uh, building. Another funny thing was, at pre-vocational level, we are emphasizing skills which are uh, especially which, against which were male dominated. The same applies to this uh, youth at the community level. We also encourage them to venture into the schools which are again male dominated. In business, these male dominated courses, most of them are highly profitable as compared to those most of the traditional people dominated. So in engineering, mechanics, welding, and we have seen quite a number of our uh, youth engaging in this people in this male dominated courses. I can say it was around 70, 80% of the youth were females who were engaged in building, welding, daughter make electrical, electrical engineering and all that. Thank you very much. I think I will continue uh, from there I, discussing about the number of youth empowerment skills which we are working with to ensure that they are economically empowered. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask Jocelyn, how is this all responsive to the situation of girls and young women? Thank you so much, Veronica. Good day to you, everyone. It's my pleasure to be meeting with you. So uh, how we are including women and girls, uh, maybe I'll start by giving you a snapshot of the Zimbabwe situation, whereby the areas we operate in, that is Buhera and Mutari, it's right to patriarchal norms, whereby a girl child is seen as a nobody, where still if she's disabled, where she suffers double discrimination. So there's a lot of interlocking discrimination as far as race is concerned, the color and the urban and rural. So these schools we are talking about, they are out there in the rural areas where the social norms are discriminating a girl child, despite us having laws that say equality and non-discrimination, giving our um, our supreme law, which is our constitution, which says non-discrimination. But the lived realities of these young girls who are at the age of 22 to 12 to 22, they suffer a social norm. So what we have done is start for girls, we use uh, so many approaches to address these social norms. Because as you all know, education <coughs> is the cornerstone to achieve everything. Like the Sustainable Development Goal says, uh, if everyone uh, uh, accesses education, it's easy to access other rights. That is right to health, right to bodily integrity, right to any other right. So the first part of all, we want to make sure this, this child is engaged in school. And mind you, this little girl, she's not operating in a vacuum. The system that surrounds them, be it a family institution, whether it's a community, they're all these structures that are perpetrated. So we need to address this system stress so that she, she's, she's schooling in an enabling environment. So 
So what we have done, we, we have used the SAR methodology whereby we want to analyze the social norms and address them that are perpetrating a girl child not to go to work. So we have also engaged male, because the males back there in Uyera and Mutare, uh, they, they, they are due to patriarchy, they, are, they have what we call uh, hegemonic toxic masculinities. So we need to try and address those. So whereby we are engaging male on board, so that at least they are the influencing changes, if they are the gatekeepers. So we have involved men as our male champions. And also we do have some facilitators who will be responsible for, for uh, social norm change. So we are want to strengthen the community such that like right now, four years down the line, start for girls will be going up. So we need to strengthen the, the, the system so that even if start for girls is no longer there, they can continue to preach about social norm change even once we are both, we have lost your voice. Even at school level, like nurses alluded to, we do help the child protection committees where we are need to tell them to advocate for themselves through giving themselves their friendly spaces, like the leadership camps, whereby they go, it's a safe space for them. I'm talking about the child who has been there out in the remote. We have never had the exposure to, to see other girls, to interact. So we want to build their confidence first so that they can be who they are, they can claim their rights, because you cannot claim whatever you don't know about. So the first part of course is to build their confidence, financial literacy, even career guidance, so that they can be guided to, to discover what they want. So we are happy to say that uh, with these leadership camps, we managed to see these little girls, they are blossoming like flowers right now. Like each time we have given the UA International Celebration, we lead them to take the lead, because in our African culture, mostly children are not supposed to be happy. They are out there, they are invisible. So we, the first point of call is to give them their right so that they can stand up and showcase what they have. So what we do is in celebration of all these, um, of all these international human rights day, we give them a platform whereby they do their own platform using their creativity, their own. So that's what we've done so far. It also we involve the community leaders who are the traditional leaders, the religious leaders, so that at least they can influence change. So in the communities we work with, they are not leaving them behind. They are running behind social norm change as well. And also we use different platforms like the radio dialogues, whereby we make sure that we hear out all these things. And we cannot talk of women empowerment when we left these girls, uh, like most of them, they do not have study time. So we address the unpaid care work as well to make sure that they have equal time to study. Because in the African culture, whenever you're a girl, whenever you're a woman, you do all the junk work. So we need to change this mindset of this men. So today, if you come in these communities, it's interesting to see how many have joined in. They're also doing all those roles which were once discussed that they are women. So we, that's what we're doing in Start for Girls. Can go on and on and on, but the lot is we are doing. And also, we are using the uh, Canada, yeah, Canada Feminine International Policy to guide us in the human rights based approach. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dawson. Well, this all feels pretty nice, very pretty. But I want to ask Robert, who's his measurement man, how do we? Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So, from the male side, uh, we always love to have this platform to say anything explained and not documented and also be considered as it did not happen. So, as a maybe now, we're just chipping in to ensure that at least we connect that dot in terms of evidence, generation, and documentation. So, we've got a uh, number of approaches that we're also using for both qualitative, also to put just element first behind all these actions that we are also doing for the girl child and also not forgetting those with disabilities and the young men that we are closely working with and also together with the stakeholders. So we are just there to put the element first through evidence generation, documentation, which is the phase that we are working in. So we are currently responding to some of the learning agendas that we've got a great set of 10 learning agendas covering the women economic empowerment pillar, gender and education. Just to make it to understand how we are also taking it in for us to pick the brains and also generate evidence that we can also broadcast for both uh, the community, stakeholders, and the partnerships that we also have. So
So as a MND, we are just there to come up with tools or to, to just ensure that at least their work is also easy. But then we also use the participatory approach where we are also uh, onboarding everyone to just make sure that at least they've got a common understanding, uh, common vision, also ensuring that at least uh, we deliver and also respond to the project indicators. I want to just go deep into the indicators and the figures I know people think about oh, now is the figure made, but then the role is just for us to make sure that we connect them, especially around the three pathways of change, this is education, gender, and the women community powers. So I think in a nutshell, that is the uh, main need for you. Then for the learning pieces, I think we also work with our student quality, uh, the quality associates, of course, number two, who are already on the ground, like in Zimbabwe, the quality has a bit of some data for us to be able to document some of the great changes that we are also noticing, especially around uh, empowering the culture. So those are some of the interventions that we are also doing. So back on the course, the oil department, because yes, of course, we might have an engine, but then the car can't move. If we don't have the oil, so we are just all just in that everything else is also drawing according to the expectations of be it the donor, be it the stakeholders, the partners, and even the communities. Then we also have got uh, feedback and accountability mechanisms as well. We are also onboarding everyone, even the participants, communities, stakeholders, even the, 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 the support of uh, staff members, just to ask for others and also pick brains around. How they are also uh, appreciating the interventions that we are doing. And this, uh, the feedback will also assist us in also maybe going back to the drawing board and also reflect on some of the quick things that we are also noticing and also going back to uh, some of the gaps that we might have uh, picked. So I think, in a nutshell, those are some of the uh, key highlights from the MMA department. Thank you. But then we work as one because. Everything is participatory. Everyone is a learning people of person. Yes, of course, we're just there to give maybe technical guidance to say that this I think we need to. And we also simplify uh indicators to ensure that at least we are moving in the same uh us. Thank you. Lilia, I know during the you explained so much yesterday on our other segment. Um, but I wanted to ask, as you were implementing this program, were there key challenges that you saw and that you had to address over time? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Veronica. That is a very difficult question. <laughs> but um, I will try to, to stick to the question. So um, just to appreciate um, the start for those project. It's one of the biggest projects um, within AK International in Zimbabwe. It's um, a 32 member team. Here, yeah, this is just a representation of the big team uh, that we left at the end. And um, I neglect to say that I was the first person to be on the start for those project in um, 2020 when we started. So um, from then, up to now, uh, from where I'm sitting as the lead of the project, I'm very happy. We have experienced quite a number of challenges, but I'm glad that today we are now speaking about time. So, so to start with, um, just uh, learning from all you are getting from my colleagues, uh, who are focusing on different uh, specific areas, education, gender, economic empowerment, and uh, MHE. It also means we are working with um, a number of government line ministries as they call. So when we got our envelope from GAC, it means we had um, to have memorandum of understandings with different line ministries. It's an education project, yes, where we have a big MOU with the Ministry of Education, but we are also working with uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs, Community and Media Enterprises Department, which the gender pillars falls under. We are also working with the Ministry of Youth where the economic employment this is for and we are also working with the Central Statistics Department uh, from the MND side and of course the Ministry of uh, Education. So the major challenge was also trying to get the operational space uh, in terms of having those uh, documentations in place. 
Because my key role was to ensure that all these guys in there be conducive environment for them to implement whatever we are talking about. So it means we had to go to the ministry officials, explain our models, what we wanted to achieve, are sharing with them that we are implementing this project with Cody Institute, which is a Canadian partner, which they were not seeing, and they also wanted to understand what is it that they will be offering that we cannot also do from here in Zimbabwe. So from all those learnings, all those challenges, with all those engagements we were doing, we were able to convince them and they gave us all the documentation and here we are. So looking at our start of those projects, be it an acronym, as I said, our overall goal is to see increased attendance, restriction, training, partners, and all those education outcomes are uh, focusing on our girls who are in the communities that I just uh, explained. So as we are seeing the results now, the challenges were mainly around the operational context, the engagement with the different stakeholders. For some projects, it's straightforward if you're working with one line ministry, but bringing all those stakeholders in one house, them to appreciate what we want to do, it was a real challenge. But because we had um, experiences from our previous programming, sharing with them what we had done before, they had to believe in us and we, we managed to achieve that. Then COVID again, the project was a COVID baby. The grant was approved in the, on the peak of COVID. And we're also trying to see now that the grant is February 2020. We want to implement, time is already ticking. The grant will be in March 2024, it's a four year project. How are we going to select the other three schools? How are we going to go there? How are we going to identify the communities? All these different pieces we are talking about, the TV, the school activities, the gender, the social analysis and action models, and also on top of that, we have our partner called who is also out there with more models that we also want to pilot, but the operational space is not allowing that. So we had to come up with um, quite a number of adaptive strategies. I remember back home, we're not used to use Zoom, but we did our inception meeting and we were not sure after sending the link whether Aileen has received it whether Robin has received it, whether Veronica is hearing what we are saying, because we're also experimenting, but when we reflect back, we are so glad that we managed to do it, because we also invited those other stakeholders we are talking about from government line ministry, so that they could become in part of the, of the inception meeting, where we were explaining the project that we did not know how we were going to achieve all these project activities. So the other challenges, they are now like minor, they are day to day, as we are establishing different structures at community at school level. We are now saying, oh, so we managed to do this, and we are glad that. Um, as also as we're working with Cody, most of the engagements were virtual, and you don't know the person that you are talking about. Sometimes you know it's different when you are talking on Zoom, it's when you see the person in person. It was now a different story when Veronica and Martha are visiting in Zimbabwe. We are speaking the same language. They appreciate the context. We are now developing and modeling our approaches better because we have gone through the whole process together. So one of the challenges again, it was also with regards to turnover of staff. You know, with such a setup, we have someone who is in K Canada, we have others in K Zimbabwe, we have others in Kodi. If you just lose one piece and you have a new person on board, it, I tell you, it will be a challenge to walk you through from inception to where we are now, but we are glad that we still have that institutional memory from inception in August 2020 up to date. And from where I'm seated, I'm glad. Now, any challenge that we are facing, we know we always be out. And we are glad that the three pillars, education, economic empowerment, and gender, of course, with MNG as overall, we are now in a position to tell our full story and we are great as a start for those projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lilia. I'm going to ask if there are questions from our TV audience. They may be calling in. And I'll ask them to use the microphone if you want to come up and ask a question. Oh, of course, Niha, do you have a question? Thank you. 
Veronica. So I know Start for Growth has a lot of innovations and a lot of approaches. And Lawrence, maybe you have talked about the community based mentorship uh, approach. Uh, so I want to ask Nancy also just to tell us more about the school resilience framework as one of those very important innovations that are part of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mia, for presentation. I like it. The education is very important. And we have spent the whole day talking about it. And we have talked about the issue of school resilience. Yes, so we will also include um, a, a school resilience uh, component into the education piece where we are exposing our learners. Income generating activity that is being done with the idea being to promote resilience, especially economic <coughs> amongst girls, promote participation in practical and areas so that they are able to, to respond to shocks, to stresses, and potential risks that they may face. So we, we have incorporated that resilience framework into a case major model, model so which we have incorporated into the education curriculum. So that enables the, the learners to, to, to predict the risks, to prepare for the risks, and to respond. So we have started seeing early results in that framework where some of the learners have started uh, what we call safe schools initiatives. So these are adolescent led initiatives where the learners identify risks, risks that the potential of affecting their learning, their learning. So it is adolescent girls led. Like I highlighted earlier to say we have that weakness of identifying uh, issues as adults. For the learners. But in this case, these adolescent girls go forward, they identify potential risks, they, they develop a checklist for identifying those, those risks, they develop plans for mitigating the risks. We call them DRR plans, that's the risk reduction plan. So that is the, in brief. What we are calling climate resilience building. In fact, it's called a climate smart resilience building. Because we have a, a, an aspect where we want to promote uh, climate smartness in, in rolling out the income generating activity, where the waste that comes from the income generating activities is sent for recycling. And also, we want our learners to be aware of. Climate uh, potential climate risks. risks. So I think in brief, I have tried to ask the question. Thank you, Manashi, and thank you, Nihar. Any other questions? I see some hands behind. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and congratulations. I was very inspired as I was listening to your presentation and almost saying, why can't you come to Tanzania <laughs> the whole team so that we really push for that. Uh, I just wanted to know whether you are pushing for uh, curriculum to be accommodative and have the training, uh, the, the training teachers for ages uh, that adopted the methodology so that we have the sustainability of what you're doing today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, afternoon once again. So thank you for the question. I think it's such a brilliant question. So a start for those you also uh, work with uh, community structures and school structures. So while we're at school, we work closely with the ENC teachers, whereby like they're also working hand in glove uh, with uh, 
the, the junior led uh, structures, these are the junior school development committees, we also have got spearheaders, if you think well, Jocelyn was also highlighting, so we've got such, some structures that we've got, we've got spearheaders across the school. So those are some of the structures that we also represent. Uh, as a project, I think, uh, just of course, Nancy highlighted about the big needs. Um, in all the 103 uh, schools that we have, 700 schools uh, that we are operating in, um, the GMC uh, is now taken as a learning area whereby like, it's now also appearing on the, the school timetable. So those are some of the great students that we've taken. Okay, so also in addition to that, um, you are also asking if we are pushing for for curriculum uh, reviews or change. So um, as an organization, is K International in Zimbabwe, uh, we have um, a number of uh, thematic areas that we are focusing on. Education being uh, one of the key ones. In addition to food security, livelihoods, wash, water, and sanitation and also uh, resilience building. So under the education piece, uh, as an organization, we are a member of um, what we call the Education Coalition of Zimbabwe. That's our uh, equity. Um, so that is uh, the mouthpiece of our uh, civic society actors who are into our uh, education in uh, Zimbabwe. In the scale, we are a very active member in that platform. So recently, uh, the government has been doing a uh, curriculum reviews with uh, the parents, the teachers, and the learners, because they do those reviews uh, every seven years. And as because uh, we are one of their flagships under the education sector, they reached out to us because they know we are piloting uh, quite a number of models under the set for those projects. And um, we are participating in those discussions so that we can also uh, make our contribution, especially around uh, the state school initiatives, and also uh, the Tibet component that we are talking about. And of course, it's uh, okay. We are very uh, strong in uh, gender programming. So we are also influencing in those space. So currently, those reviews are happening and we are in active participate. Uh, so that we are also sharing what we are observing during our process monitoring activities, the everything that we are getting from the ground so that we can also fit uh, into that. Then also, if we um, we are also working with our teacher training colleges, but if they find out where uh, we understand that uh, the guidance and counseling teachers we are working with, they are a product of the teacher training colleges, and we are expecting them to provide the service within the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education Ministry, which is a different ministry. So teachers are trained by the Ministry of Higher Education and Education, and the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education will be the consumer. So we are also trying to uh, pilot with one of the teacher training colleges who are participating under the start for those projects, um, uh, which is in one of uh, the districts we are operating in. So that um, the teachers are also going through some of the materials that we are training with our support from our colleagues who are supporting us in our curriculum development. So it's a pilot and we are working that uh, we are going to share the results with the two ministries because we are also advocating for the two ministries to be speaking to each other. As one is offering a service and the other is offering a product. So we are also um, working on that to ensure that if the project will be coming to an end, we are going to head over all these results to the ministries and hoping that they will be speaking to each other at the end of uh, each all. Thank you. Thank you very much for very well organized the presentation. I thank you, the team, uh, and also appreciate the approach you have. The, the project have utilized, like the mailing list, the mentorship, and also the difficult uh, parts where girls are always being uh, looked at. The EBT approach is also very uh, good. Uh, my question is, since we are in the group for two, that uh, the, the, the community of consensus in the community is the base for the transformative change in gender responsiveness. Uh, regarding the unpaid work that my sister has mentioned, 
we want to learn from this, then the burden of the domestic work is the girls and the mothers. We have the economic empowerment program, very well, well designed and it is very successful. But when you look at the domestic side, it is a burden of the girls and the girl child. So what is the exact uh, approach you are applying to minimize uh, the girls' burden to uh, properly attain, to properly engage in the gender responsive uh, activities? So please uh, share your experience. Okay, so I was talking then to see you all. Um, Oh, answer to your question. So I just wanted us to appreciate that and the start for those projects was a um, design as a developmental project uh, before COVID. So um, when we got it and COVID was there, uh, the, uh, Global Affairs Canada to give us additional resources to support the developmental project, which was mainly focusing on uh, COVID activities. So on that, we, were, we got some resources to address those unpaid uh, care work uh, issues we are talking about. So, Jocelyn will start, uh, we'll speak to that, but I just wanted you to appreciate that. Otherwise, if it was not because of those additional resources, we were still going to continue with our developmental uh, activities, where, uh, which were designed uh, when the start of those projects started uh, before COVID. But we later realized that in our areas of cooperation, despite the patriarchal issues we are talking about, there was an um, increase in dropout rates. And we also wanted to look into that through the unpaid care work activities that we were working on. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. In addition to what Yurida has just said, uh, actually, when we got that amount, we had to do a baseline survey through the assistant of OD in Care Canada whereby we were, uh, wanted to make sure the areas, the domains, so that we can come up with proper intervention. So, like I told you, we use the SAR methodology, whereby we are challenging uh, the social norms which are harmful. So, in what they do in the communities, we steer dialogues using the different kind of tools to, for the community to reach where we call the aha moment, whereby they see that, work is not uh, skilled properly, it's unbalanced. So we do it in such a way that they will notice on, the, on their own using the same methodology. Then after they have noticed, we ask them, based on this, you're saying maybe we have to use the 24 hour clock. Then they'll actually see that, oh, from dawn to dusk, it's women and girls wear up. And also it is going to affect the results of the young girls. So as community, we, we throw it back to them so that they, they come up with interventions. Then let me notice this, what are we going to do? So they come up with action plans of what they think as a community. If we have this, we'll be able to solve this. Because to us, we are saying the communities are not passive. They do have something to offer. So it's like we'll be steering them, guiding them through the, our, uh, our tools which we use. So thank you. I hope you answered. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for your nice explanation. My question goes to youth economic environment. We have uh, some projects in Ethiopia, and the question is, we know that uh, youth, after uh, they completed their skills, they face some challenge in the market. How they save their skills and themselves, they, what they have learned. So what kind of support do you give after they graduated, uh, the, the skills provided. So that's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's a, a well, it's a concern of many, in the many communities. Say maybe after training, what do I do? After training, many of the uh, graduates, after training, they got to move out of the college and they became, they become desperate for what's next. 
So with the start for girls project, uh, this project I can say is some of, there is some kind of a holistic type of approach. We have the community, we have the school, we have the tertiary institution. These tertiary institutions they offer different types of technical skills. So when a youth is coming out of the secondary school, the youth is skilled in partially skilled in different uh, components, and that youth is channeled into the tertiary institutions, which again try to build those skills. After building those skills, these skills, who is informing the youth to get those skills? It should be the community, and that is what is happening in the start of your the community have put a number of gaps within it, which should be answered by the school and by the uh, training centers, which is the teacher institution, by the polytechnical colleges, by the teachers' colleges. After the start for girls started working with the youth, what did they did, what we did was to ensure that after that uh, economic opportunities assessment, we said then, what do you think are some of the challenges which you are facing, which forbids or disturbs you to? continue after you get the schools and they highlighted the component of uh, uh, the statistics. They also highlighted the issue of a gap in business training, entrepreneurship training. So what we did was to ensure that the youth, they get training and post training statistics, which they use during training to ensure that their skills are enhanced or they get used to the statistics to the working machine, uh, to building processes, to mechanics, uh, those tools which are supposed to be used, they have actually concrete sets which were bought by the project to ensure that they get to them during training and those sets they use them after training to actually start the, so that they become well, well then we they again train them in entrepreneurship. That training in entrepreneurship opened it, uh, I can say, very, a ray of light to the majority of them to say, after this training, we have to start our own businesses. So they use the tools which they got, they use the standard things which they got during training to start. Some of them, they have already started small cooperatives in numbers of five, numbers of three, with the tools which they got from the project to start their own business. And they are continuously getting some mentorship support from their mentors, from professional training uh, colleges that post training follow ups to ensure that they can still use those skills after the training. They can still use those tools after the training. They met them, the entrepreneurship approach enabled them to actually venture into the market. We capacitated them to ensure that they understand the market which they are getting into. They understand, they understand their competitors whom they are going to be meeting. So whatever they were producing at college level during training was supposed to match the competition within the community which they were supposed to get to make. How could this be done? The training was closely monitored by specialists, the specialists at the professional training centers. These are specialized lecturers who supported the men to ensure that whatever they produce was competitive enough to meet the local market. So that was the strategy which we used to ensure that this group, they can actually venture into a market which is full of competition. And we are right now trying to assess to what extent can they really make this competition. That is the learning curve which my brother here is actually ready to actually go through assessing whether this is working. But I tell you, so far what they produce, uh, from my own assess assessment, and the assessment by even the directorate from our government, they really said this youth they deserve the certificate of competence rather than the certificate of attendance because of the skills which they uh, which they managed to get and the products, the quality of the product which they are already producing, which was they produced during the training session. Thank you. I don't know whether I do I uh, responded to you, and I still want to learn more from the team. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lawrence, for also one thing. 
So as an idea, I think we got a little piece around the question that you are having. So we are also working on that. I think uh, the team is on the ground collecting the data and also trying to appreciate some of the key challenges that you are also facing. So explain something, I think, uh, in the long run, and I think we'll also be sharing through God. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. 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 Which will be out here in the region of the Heinz, uh, with by uh, UKX. I'm very much interested in you when you present your program. Uh, I want to learn more about uh, particularly school safety. There are a lot of factors that affect others to the role and you know, attain, uh, achieve uh, as compared to uh, boys. Uh, Particularly in classrooms, our traditional teaching methodology is very, uh, very one focused, as I think, male methods, and usually excludes or it's not inclusive. So, what kind of training is uh, I mean, the project uh, have been providing to make classrooms more inclusive and also make uh, girls uh, activated? Another one is, you know, in, in my project uh, is in rural part of Ethiopia, and one of the, the greatest challenges is uh, making schools more you know, responsive and very inclusive, including, you know, making uh, school leadership itself, school physical empowerment, including that things. You know, these are really challenges that uh, are facing and it's key affects the world. So, how you do project? That tries to tries to improve the situation. The other one is, uh, I mean, in, in our period program, uh, we have this uh, short term skill trainings, and uh, the goal of the, this training is to make the girls to have one uh, self employment, as you have already mentioned, the other one is with employment. Uh, we have some uh, local industry partners, uh, we, we are interested to, to, to employ these girls, but some of the thing is. They pay very low uh, wage, so the girls are not interested to, 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 to join that partners. We have such mechanism in the project. And the other one is, is you know, uh, IG groups that uh, you were mentioning that two, three, four, five girls uh, uh, join together to have their own business. Uh, but in, in my case, many of the girls uh, prefer individual business. They, 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 you know, we try. To make them to group of three, four, five, that many of the, the girls want to, to start individually. But what's your case? Can I ask for the microphone? It's coming out. Okay, so I'll. I will respond to the first question. Um, I, 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 wanted to use, I wanted to use my voice. Anyway, thank you. So, uh, I'll try to respond to the first uh, question to say, how are, you, how are you building the capacity of the learners so that they can you know, engage in self school initiatives? Yeah, so, yeah, we are also a learning project. Yeah, we also want to interact in it. But what we are doing is uh, we have provided platforms for the adolescent girls to generate the issues for to make risk assessments, uh, mapping the, the risks from house of level and then on their way to school and at school and back. So they, they are able to generate or identify the risks or issues that affect their learning and roots at school and back. 
So that is what the first stage, the first step that we have done. We have to learn how to identify with identity. And then after that, they rank the risk and prioritize the risk of them by themselves. So our, our role is to guide. And the role of the teacher is also to guide. And to learn how to take the, the leading role and prioritize the issues or the risks that they feel they are facing. And then they develop action plans, develop a specific action plan to address the, the risks that they think they are affected. So after that, we they, they also develop a checklist that they routine, routinely implement just assess the level of the risk within the school and on their way and way. <coughs> so that is how we will plan it. But we have that that is within a framework which we call the participatory manual and school kind of process. <coughs> it's a framework which is which we develop so I think in brief, that is how we, we, we have done it. We have allowed the learners to do it themselves. And then we, we, we as, as, as they will be identified the risk, we make sure the, the, the assessment is inclusive. We don't leave behind those with disabilities. They should be ready to also participate. So I, I think in short, also, for it to be more inclusive, like what Monique has just said, we made sure that uh, before the teachers, the GNC teachers, we targeted them, we trained them on gender and disability inclusion, whereby through stakeholder engagement, like stakeholders like <clears throat> Minister of uh, Higher Education through their psychology department, they'll be able to train the teachers because normally people, uh, when you talk of disabilities, people will just think of the physical disability, yet there are other disabilities which are hidden, which are hard to see. So these are the part of the training that we have capacitated with the teachers so that at least it can be inclusive as well. Thank you. And the teachers also cascade uh, the trainings down to their learners because uh, that is our focal point for the learners, especially with the girls. So I think the learners can also add. Thank you very much. Okay. Maybe on the economic empowerment bit, uh, the we, I can say we have a multi, a multi or three sectoral type of approach in the economic empowerment. We have the IGA based village and lending. We have the IG, the income generating activities based type of uh, settings and lending processes. We have the income generating activities, which I do or can also can also as an answer to some of the uh, COVID challenges. We also have this membership. So when you say when you ask about the groups, uh, youth, uh, you said you actually try to make them enter into groups. So but what we do is we don't we just train them, exposing them to a variety of, of uh, information so for them to select, especially during the interview uh, training. Uh, we give them information on the opportunities available as they as they try by all means to formulate their own company. We have companies where they work, they can work at a group where the sole traders and all that. So we expose them to those uh, opportunity, opportunities available to you as working as an individual, you working as a group, working as a very large group, working as a, a small group. And then we give them a, we give them an environment where they can actually go out, see to themselves uh, what are the advantages for those who have actually formulated the company and working as a group. And those who have formulated the company and they work as a very large group. Those an individual who have formulated the company and working as an individual. We give practical examples. And they also get into the practice they see what is good for them. It is them, 
decide. Don't you decide for them so that they can say, you say you wake is three, you wake is five, you wake is two. Let them decide. And what I've seen so far, I've seen others who have decided to wake is three. I've seen others who have decided to wake is a very small group of three. I've seen others who have said you can wake is uh, the whole group who, who, which was trained, we trained them on five. Okay, the group is a specific trait. So we help them no information and the practical experience. And we say it's yours, it's yours. And what is important here is a follow-up, post-training follow-up to see to what extent is this one uh, uh, managing the business. And I tell you, it won't be a surprise to learn that after that training, we are we emphasize the issue of them creating employment for themselves, them creating employment for others. But it won't be sugar to see that after training, someone can easily say, I know what to trade. I will change the trade to another trade. We won't limit them to that. To say you should stick on to this business always change and the things the, the atmosphere within the area always change. So we don't prescribe anything but to give them their choice and freedom to decide. Thank you. Yeah, so I think thank you, Lawrence. So we've got a set of tools that we also use to the training for them to be able to decide. So those are some of the facilitation uh, skills that we are also using across the three pillars to just ensure that at least it is participatory and no one is also left behind from forgetting those who disagree with this. Thank you. Okay, so to add on the question that you asked around um, issues to do with inclusion and also um, challenges with engaging um, different stakeholders in the school setup to ensure that we have that buying support uh, for the activities that we are proposing. Um, I also wanted to say that um, as a project, we have a very strong stakeholder engagement plan because we have realized that uh, we are dealing with quite a number of stakeholders in as much as we want to achieve the overall goal of um, improving the education outcomes. But for us to get there, there are quite a number of small dots that we need to, to connect. So um, as a project, we have adopted the community scorecard approach. I know um, maybe some of us will read about it. So that approach is normally, it's normally used in the youth sector to identify uh, certain position challenges. And uh, then um, the communities will identify those challenges together and come up with a solution. So when we went through that uh, process, uh, we realized that we could also use the same approach within uh, the education sector. But um, when we introduced it to the ministry, they said the moment we call it community scorecard, then it's outside our um, um, areas of our operation. They, they say, let's call it participatory scorecard, where we are bringing together the different stakeholders who have a stake in the education sector. Because normally within the education sector, the communication is just top down, where you are just uh, teachers are trained, they are told what to do. They also cascade the same to the learners. And there is no space given to the learners to also share their views in terms of uh, the kind of education that they also require. So with the participatory scorecard approach, we are rolling it out at a school level where we are bringing together the school authorities, the school development committee, the parents and the learners so that they identify those education service provision challenges together. Be it around the provision of menstrual gene management kits, issues to do with the third schools initiatives that we are talking about, issues to do with um, um, even water provision, which is the key resource within uh, the school setup. So, as they are doing that process, uh, guided by the scorecard process, they are managing to identify those challenges, prioritize them, and at the end of the day, they come up with the action plans that they are developing based on capacities that they have uh, at a school level. So that way, it will not be like a, um, a care start for those initiatives, but um, it will now be school um, owned as uh, the learners will be part of the committee that will be following from that. So uh, today, we are actually glad that through making use of the community scorecard approach, there are some schools that have managed to drill even balls uh, without the support from uh, the project resources from global affairs Canada, but through the, that uh, engagement that we have managed to link them with their different stakeholders and schools are doing it on their own. 
and also uh, provide some of the resources or even preparing their school blocks or even making sure that their schools are safe because of rolling out of the school card approach. So those are one, uh, some of the approaches that we are using, but we really uh, understand the challenges, especially when uh, the stakeholders they are working on do not understand where we really want to get to. So we have a very strong stakeholder engagement plan, which clearly lays out who is supposed to do what and when, and we are trying to come up with different um, advocacy documents in terms of how we can reach out to them so that they can be part of us. But now it's, it's now flowing and at the start of those projects, it's no longer a KQG project, but it's now a government project just because we are just done with our year three. But when we started, yeah, it was difficult and they were also asked, what exactly do you want to do? How are we going to go about it? But yeah, it's now coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Lawrence, Wilbur, Jocelyn, and Manetsi. No more trouble here. <laughs> and I want to thank our audience for, for also joining us for having those great questions. And we have finished Bobby Live. <laughs>